the accent, it was um, it was a definitely a lot more me because I could even just like to be able to have a conversation <laughs> on television or in an interview. Um, it was very liberating. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Out of Character. I'm your host, Ryan Satin, and as you can see, we are in the middle of Superstore access for WrestleMania week. And uh, yeah! yeah! Come on, baby! We I'm, back! Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm like a huge wrestling fan. I have been coming to access for so long as a wrestling fan going to WrestleMania. So to be here doing the show here live with all of you here is super awesome. So thank you all for coming. But really thank you to my guest this week, Kofi Kingston. I really hey. appreciate you coming. Hey, here we are. Oh, oh, we, a chance. Yeah. This is so much cooler to me live show. Oh, my God. I don't get chance oh my in the studio. God. Yeah. You know, you, know, you can filter them in, right? You know, fix them in post. You put them in sand, amplify it. So I'm going to start off this episode the way I start off every episode, and that's asking you, how much of your real true self is there in the character that you play on TV? How much of my real true self? I... <laughs> I feel like the character that I play on TV is like just, and this is like a real cliche term, but it's me with the volume turned all the way up. Uh, I, you, you see, you see me twerk in the ring, you know. You guys, you guys seen me twerk in the ring before? Do you remember the? You remember the twerk? If you haven't seen it, this is what you get when you come to Access. But you, you know, you, you see me twerk in the ring. I would, I would twerk at my at my house. I would twerk. Um, <laughs> you know, in the forest with the family, uh, I, I would twerk anywhere. So a lot of what you see me doing in the ring is stuff that I would do at home. So I, I mean, it's gotta be like a, probably like 110% if that percentage makes sense. Yeah. Do you think though that being part of New Day helped you get to do that? Because before it wasn't necessarily the case, right? Not, not at all. Yeah, I, I do think that being with New Day uh, helped me Woods and E, a lot, it just allowed us to show our personality, man, you know, and go out and like have fun. Before, y'all remember Kofi Kingston from right near the bitch. Y'all remember Kofi Kingston from Kingston, Jamaica. That just took me back. You know what I'm saying, boy? <laughs> Traveling paradise, boy. Tra right near the bitch, where you from, boy? Thunder clap, boy. Up in the dance hall, baby. You know what I'm talking about. Y'all remember that Kofi Kingston, you know? Yeah. That really wasn't me. It's a surprise that that wasn't really me. You but know? what about when you so, dropped the accent though? Was when, it a little more you after when, that? When I got to drop the accent, it was um, it was a definitely a lot more me because I could even just like to be able to have a conversation <laughs> yeah. on television or in an interview. Um, it was very liberating. But at the same time, I felt like, and maybe it was because I was still like, you know, fresh in my career at that point. But, um, you know, I didn't feel like 100% comfortable with Ian Woods. All the fun you see us having is genuine. It's real. Like we're out there literally just trying to like pop ourselves and everyone just happens to be there watching and enjoying it. So yeah, we, we, uh, we, we got a lot of free reign as the new day too, as time went along and we got to make it our own. We got to really just, just do whatever we wanted. You know, we had carte blanche. We could do whatever we want and we could show our personalities. We'd ride together. So a lot of the things that we would say and do in the car rides, we just brought that into the ring and amplified it. So yeah, it, it was um, probably the best thing that has ever happened to me in my career as far as being able to like, just show personality and, and have the fun that you're supposed to have in this business. And I think that, you know, you guys being able to show your true selves like that has been inspiring to a lot of people. Like I watched the, the round table that you did with you, Lashley and Big E, you talked yeah. about how it's been nice for you guys to hear like other people come up to you and say like you've inspired me to be my most authentic self yeah. in front of other people and i think that's super important it is super important because i think there's a lot of things you know career wise where i feel like people you, you work to like impress people so you end up just being a version of yourself that you're not comfortable with or that's not authentic even like in high school you're trying to fit in so you're trying so hardly so hard to fit in that you just sometimes you lose yourself Yep. You know, and you'll go home and be like, man, this wasn't really a good day. I didn't really get to like show who I was. I didn't feel like I was being true to myself. So when you see um, athletes like myself, Woods and E going out there and we're wearing unicorn horns and we're wearing pink and we're swiveling our hips and we're having good times, like we think it's important for everyone to like to, to, to feel like that. 
Not that everybody's got to go out there and shake their hips, but if you should feel compelled to shake your hips, doggone it, you should be able to shake your hips and yes. feel confident doing so. So that's a big part of what we do is being able to be our authentic selves and let people know that like, you know, whatever it is that you're into, if you know, you're, you're, you're a big, strong athlete, you can still be into comic books, you can still be into anime, you can still be into video games, and someone might call you a geek or, you know, a nerd or whatever, and that's okay, because you're enjoying what it is that you're doing. Yeah, I, I genuinely think it's so important for people to learn that lesson, because even me, like, 35 years old, and sometimes I say, like, do I know who I am as a person? Like, or have I, I, been, or have I been just been doing things that I, that I think other people want from me and stuff? So it's, it's yeah. nice when you can see someone like you guys who is having success doing that. I mean, Woods, it's crazy when you see Woods, how much he's constantly manifesting these things that he wants into reality. Yeah, man, Woods is a very, very special individual and someone I'm proud to call my brother, you know, and that I, I you know, I, I, I tell Woods and E, we have this conversation a couple times a month where we just like, start gushing through text and, and letting each other know like how much we appreciate one another. I feel like, um, man, if I were to have met one person that I have a, a connection with as strong as Woods or E, my life would have been great. Now I, I have two, two people that just by chance and by where we were in our careers, our paths crossed and we were able to bond and realize that we had so much in common and um, it's just, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. So like knowing Woods and, and how hard he's worked to get here, you know, and, and just the way that he thinks. He thinks he lives outside the box. He, you know, you see a, like a standard stereotypical box. He is like way on the other side of the room. And sometimes you won't even know like if his ideas are, are possible. You won't even know like what, he, what he's even talking about. But then as time goes on and step by step, like, it, it, it just starts to like, you know, actualize. And it's like, that's what he meant. Now I understand his mind is really, really special. And um, yeah, you, you, luckily we all get to see the benefit of that through up, up, down, down, you know, obviously through what we do in the ring, but even outside of the ring. And now him like hosting game shows on Nickelodeon, like he'll go online. You can go on his Twitter page and see the goals that he has set. Like from years ago, he'll say like, oh, I, I, I'm gonna host Nick Arcade or whatever it is. And then like, he just did that. Like he hosted a show by himself on Nickelodeon that was basically like a, a, like a, like a live video game show. So um, he is a, a true example of manifesting and believing in yourself, no matter how crazy the idea might be, he's gonna find a way to make it happen. Yeah, and I think when someone thinks on that level, a lot of times people will say to them like, well, you can't do that, or you yeah. can't do this, or you can't do that. And they're like, no, no, I can. So when they do it, it's so cool. Yeah, and he's real spiteful about it too. So when you tell, <laughs> if you tell him he can't do something, he's gonna like do it for himself, but he's also gonna do it just to prove you wrong, you know, just yeah. for that little extra, you know, it's great. That's why I like that Kanye West documentary that came out uh, recently so much, regardless of what people think about him now or whatever, to see like him rapping his songs to people who were not even listening to him and him having to like, you know, mooch off of other people's recording time because he knew that he was making this album that was gonna change rap. Yeah. And I see that and I go like, that's so cool that he did do that. He had the vision. Had the know? vision, and, you know? And to believe in yourself, man, it's so important. Like I tell people all the time, like, if you have a dream, you know, uh, if you have something that you wanna do, some, something that you wanna be, like you owe it to yourself to at least try. Like at the very least, like try to do it because if it happens for you, it's the best thing in the world. If it doesn't, you can go back to whatever you were doing, you know what I'm saying, and live out the rest of your life. But if you never try to like reach for the stars and you, you know, if you, if you listen to uh, like people when they're the, the naysayers and the doubters, like you're not being fair to yourself nope. because you have the opportunity to unlock a, an incredible world of just possibilities. I think it also helps when you have a good group around you. Like you got lucky, you were saying, to have E and Woods there. And yeah. I think that like, when you find those people who also believe in you, like it's a game changer. Yeah, it is. A support system is so important. Having people that will have your back no matter what. And you know, again, like not that everything is wrestling, but with New Day, when we were given the gimmick of positivity preaching preachers, I I'll never forget it. We were sitting in a room just like this. Vince was right there. I'm over here. Woods is over here. E's over there. And we have been going back and forth with Vince about what we wanted to be, we said, we, you know, we want to be some guys who are not pleased with our positions in the company. He's like, oh, okay, well, how about you guys uh, be preachers? <laughs> and you guys come out here and you know, every, there's gospel music. And we're all sitting here and we're just like, mm-hmm. 
And we know that the people are going to reject this idea so hard because nobody comes to WWE to go to church. You know <laughs> what I'm the saying? Last thing you you, want. You, yes, sometimes WWE is on Sunday, but you are not coming to <laughs> WWE to go to church. Yeah. You know? Yes. But this is what he wanted us to do. And we told him, we said like, hey, whatever you give us, we'll make it succeed because of our chemistry. We believe in it. And he's like, all right, I'm going to put that to the test. <laughs> you guys are going to be positivity preaching preachers. Go get it over. And we're just like, all right. This is our chance, you know, and we supported each other. And there was a lot of people who took a big dump on our aspirations. You know, they didn't believe in us. They made fun of us when uh, we were just trying to we were just trying to get over. But now you fast forward and those same people have come back around and they admitted that they were wrong. And, you know, not that we do it to prove people wrong, but we, proved, we proved you wrong. <laughs> so, yeah, support nice system is really wrong. Important. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's great. Is they come back that it's that humble pie, right? You know what I'm saying? It's a humble pie. Well, I want to go back even further than New Day. Yeah. I want to go back to Jamaica, Kofi Kingston. A Kingston, bit. Jamaica, you want to go back? Because okay, I'm gonna be honest here. I a lot of people talk crap about WWE's version of ECW, yeah. but I loved WWE ECW when I was younger. Yeah. I, me and my friends used to get together and watch it every week. And when you started on there, we you were like our guy. We were yeah. so pumped on Kofi Kingston and everything that you were doing then. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. I, it has a special place in my heart. Uh, what do you remember most about filming those vignettes? Oh my God. <laughs> so uh, I remember when we were, so we, uh, this was like my first meeting with Vince. Okay. Uh, we had a bunch of like the writers and they had written out like six different skits and they were all me rescuing somebody on the beach because there was trouble in paradise and that was the line, you know? Yes. And at that time, like you're just happy to be able to get a chance to be on TV. So I'm not gonna like go through and say like, this is garbage, oh no, I don't think this is gonna work. It's like, no, I gotta figure out a way to make this work. Yep. So we're going over and he's going through all the skits and he approves everything. So we go down to Key Biscayne in Miami to film it and we filmed everything. And it was a great experience, you know, it was uh, like the first time that everybody on the set was there for me. You know what I mean? Yeah, like totally. The, we had extras and stuff and it was all rotated around, like I was the central figure. So we taped them and then, um, Gosh, uh, they started airing, you know, several weeks later. And uh, a lot of times, like, so we, we are, the, the show's being like uh, like broadcast, so you can put on a set of headphones and listen to everything that's going on between Vince and the truck and the camera guys. So, you know, as a studious guy, you put on the headset and you know, you're like listening to the show and I'm watching it and then my vignette comes on and I think it was the one where uh, I buried the guy in the sand yep. and like his face was in there and then, you know, like he kicking the kicked sand the sand in, in his face. face, you know? He's like, look like there's trouble in paradise. And then I remember Vince coming on the headset and he goes, oh, this is barely, barely passable. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, oh my God, we got six left, you know? But I'm like, oh, you know what? He must know that I'm on the headset right now and he's ribbing me. Ah, this is great. But now years later, I'm like, there's no way that he knew that I was no, on the headset. No, no way. He really thought that, that, that these vignettes were, were barely passable. This was his actual opinion and he said it out loud and like by, for all intents and purposes, like I shouldn't be here. Cause I go back and I watch those vignettes. And I'm like, oh my God, like it's, it's cringeworthy. You know what I mean? It makes, my, it makes my skin crawl a little bit. I don't like watching myself. See, I'm a sucker for cheesy vignettes to some degree. So I kind of like that stuff. Like I watched it and I was like, oh, I kind of miss these, these vignettes like I, this. I was lucky to get vignettes, but at the same time, when you have the boss who decides whether you're going to have a match next week or whether you're going to have a match in catering or a match at your house, at your table, watching the show. Then when he says that the, 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 the videos that you shot are barely passable, imagine like my world was just rocked for a, for a minute, but I, I shook it off luckily. And I mean, here we are. Did that motivate you though, when you did end up debuting to make sure that you were on point in the ring? Yeah, man, I don't, well, uh, so I, the motivation is a funny thing for me because I feel like I just hold myself to a high standard regardless and nobody can hold me to a higher standard than I hold myself to. So, you know, like asking for people's opinion about a match, unless I really, really want to know like what they thought about the way that something was, was put together or, you know, the way a sequence went or the way that like a promo was, I'm probably not going to ask because you get to a point where like, you know, if what you did was bad or not, you shouldn't have to walk through the curtain and be like, oh, 
daddy, was that good? You know, and looking for approval and stuff like that. You have to hold yourself to like the highest standards so that, you know, people, even you take like social media, for example, and there's so much positivity out there. And I love the fact that people can come on there and support what it is that I do and um, that I can go out and like motivate those same people to go out and do what they want to do. But there is a lot of negativity on there too. And people who will try to like, you know, bring you down for, because of what you did in the match and they didn't like this or they didn't like this. To me, like that doesn't affect me at all because again, like no matter how bad you thought it was, if I thought it was bad, then like I, that, that is what is going to drive me, you know? Yep. So um, I don't think that that like motivated me to like, to go out there and kill it. I was going to kill it anyway, you know? Yep. So um, that explains yeah. to me why you don't use social media as much. Like you use social media, but you're, I've noticed you seem to be someone who like looks at it for like an hour maybe and then like yeah. puts your phone away and isn't on it. I go in waves. Yeah. I go in waves every, I, like a lot of people feel like, um, like I don't want to say like slaves to social media, but you feel like you have to post something. And then a lot of times you end up being like inauthentic because you're posting for the sake of posting. Cause you want to make sure that you have like a consistent feed or whatever. For me, it's like, if I see something that's funny, I'll post it. If I want to do something that I think is funny, I'll post it. If not, then I'll take a two week hiatus until I feel compelled to get on again. So you can stay away from social media for two weeks. I can, I have. Yeah. That's a lot of, I, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. so <laughs> jealous of that. Yeah. I, I, I really wish I could do that. Cause sometimes <laughs> I'm scrolling and I'm like, why am, what am I even, why am I reading this? I don't care about any of the things I'm reading on here. I'm just doing it because it's such a habit. You can get sucked in. I, I've been getting sucked in on, on Instagram since they've been doing the, uh, what is it? The, uh, not the uh, stories, but the, uh, the, the reels. Lives. Oh yeah, the reels. Because the yeah, reels yeah. just like keep yeah. you going. And it's not even and the ones that you follow. I don't even have to swipe up. Like as soon as it's done, it swipes up for me. I'm like, oh, I can't move. Oh, this is real funny. Let me just watch this last one. And then three hours later, I'm like, God, Wasted my time. You That's know? me with TikTok. I'm yeah. the exact same way with TikTok. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like scrolling and scrolling, like, oh my God, I'm laying in bed. It's been a half hour. Yeah. What am I doing here? You know? See, I'm too old for TikTok. You know, I'm a grown, I'm a grown man. You know, I can't be on TikTok doing all the dances and all that. That's you not say, you, know, you say hey, that. You see what you know what I'm talking about. I'm a grown man. Yeah, I'm too old to be on TikTok. I think there's like a weird misconception of what TikTok is though, because people think it's mainly dances, but it's not necessarily only dancing and oh, stuff. I don't know, man. Ugh. It's there's really, a lot of there's a lot of dancing if, on there. If you're on TikTok for a week, there'll be no dancing on your feed. Really? Oh yeah, it'll start to learn uh, you. You're trying, it'll to lure, start <laughs> you're trying to you're trying to lure me in. You know, and, uh, I see what you try to do. I see what you try to do. Well, nature. We'll talk about nature because that's yeah. more of what you actually yeah, do enjoy. Yeah, the forest, the woods. Uh, so you're a nature person? Yeah, and more so because my wife, because uh, she's really. Uh, so we used to own a yoga studio in Tampa, and um, she. Uh, it's funny because she went uh, like vegan and vegetarian. And I used to eat a lot of red meat and I would go to like, uh, to five guys. The first thing I would do when I would get off the plane, I'd stop at five guys. Then we'd go home. Then I'd go to five guys again for like another meal. And you know, I like, I needed my, like my beef. And then, um, my wife was like, yeah, you know, one day you're going to be a vegetarian too. I'm like, I'll never give up my burgers, babe. I'll never give up my red meat, you know? And now here I am after reading like some articles and then watching a video on, um, on, on Facebook, does anyone know what gelatin is? Like the food? So gelatin, if, if uh, you, so it's in Jell-O, yeah, it's in like Mike and Ike's, it's in gummy bears, it's in gummy worms, it's anything like the that thing has that, that makes it gummy, gelatinous, gelatinous and yes. gummy. So there's a video and, and if, if you don't want your, your, uh, your meat eating experience to be ruined, then close your eyes and, and go somewhere else. Cause I might ruin it for you right now, but there's a video on Facebook where it's the, it shows like the reverse engineering of a gummy. So it shows somebody chewing and they take the gummy out of their mouth then they put it back in the bag. Then the bag wraps up, the bag goes to like the cart, the cart goes in the truck, the truck goes backwards to, uh, like, the factory, then the factory goes to like the slaughterhouse. And then all of a sudden, like it takes all the sugar out of the substance and it's this big, like gray nastiness. And then all of a sudden it shows like these, these pigs hanging in the slaughterhouse by their feet. And it shows their skin going up, like back up. Ooh, yeah. And I was like, oh, I'm eating that. I'm eating all this pig skin and hooves and stuff. So, not, so I just, I gave up. When was like, this? This was in like, Gosh, it must have been like 2000, 
13 or 14 or something like you that. You vegetarian that long? Yeah. So well, so so it's been gradual, right? So I gave that up, and then I read some stuff about like dairy and how like the udders and how the milk is taken. I won't get into that because it's really gross. <laughs> but if you if you're interested, go in it. You might not. You might be more of an almond milk guy instead of like calcium or, or, or you know regular dairy milk. Yeah. So um, you say what? You Oat too. Milk. You too. <laughs> Oat milk. But so, so, and then my wife's uh, family, like they grew up on a dairy farm. So they tell me the stories about like what goes into the milk. And then it's just, I, I just can't, I just can't put it into my body because it grosses me out. So then actually in 2019, the, early in the summer, I was like, man, if I see one more video on chicken, what am I going to eat? I just won't, <laughs> I won't be able to eat, you know? <laughs> so I just uh, took one weekend and I was like, you know what, let me see if I can go on the road and, and be vegetarian and, or, or vegan or whatever, and let's see how it works. And I haven't eaten any dairy or any, uh, any, any red meat since. Crazy. So now, I, like, I laugh with my wife now because we're, we're always looking at, like, vegan restaurants. What's up, homeboy? And we go to, like, uh, you know, restaurants, and we're, we have to, like, tell the, the, the waitress, like, okay, does this have any dairy in it? Are you sure? Does it have any? So many specifications, and then my son is real particular too. So we're we're that uh, that family that just, you know, nitpicks everything when we're trying to eat. But that yeah, I just tough can't on do the it road anymore, to man. keep up with that. It's tough, but you get into a groove. And um, Denny's is really great because they have Beyond Burgers, and a lot of Denny's are open like 24 hours. So that usually is my go-to. I get like a good Beyond Burger as my protein, and um, you know, it's either that or protein shakes. Tofu kind of makes your boy a little bit bloated, a little ga a little gassy, you know? So I don't really, I lean away from the tofu and the soy, but um, it's difficult, but you can make it happen if you really wanted to. So I'm gonna go back even further a little bit real fast. So when I was doing research for this, I saw that uh, the first match that you had for WWE, you teamed with Tomas Champa, is that right? Yes. That's crazy, what a trip that you guys go that far back. Bro, so. I saw him walking around here earlier. It's amazing, and we, we talk about it all the time. Like, uh, T, T was a good, like, so I went to the Chaotic Training Center up in, like, right outside of Boston. It actually used to be Killer Kowalski's uh, School of Professional Wrestling. Yep. Uh, Triple H trained there, you know, name drop. You know what I'm saying, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? no big deal. But um, the game, so, no big deal. so so yeah, so I I I, I uh, used to go there like after my nine to five or whatever, uh, and I would train there. And T was one of the trainers, Tommaso. I call him Penmanship. Y'all know about Tommy Penmanship? Of course. So y'all don't know y'all y'all just know Tom, Tommaso just Champa. Google it. Google it. Look up Tommy Penmanship. It'll change <laughs> your life. It was an amazing guy. He, he's he's got such range. But he was one of the guys who would run um, like practice. So it was him, um, uh, Ivar. Handsome Johnny, look up some of those videos. Um, gosh, there was just uh, Brian Malonis. Oh, am I allowed to mention him? Yeah. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, I mean, uh, you know what I'm saying? Right? We can, can, I, can I say that? Am I going to get fined? <laughs> Don't find me, Vince. I won't find you, you know? so we're good. So Brian, you know, but all those guys, like, they're some of the best wrestlers in New England. And I got to study under their tree. And I learned so much, you know? Um, so yeah, we, we have a lot of history, man. Like I, when I didn't know what was going on, they would guide me in the ring and, and I would just shut up and listen, like they say. And um, you know, I, it, it's crazy now to see like, you know, Tommaso's journey going to Japan, you know, his knee surgery, his neck surgery, coming back and being so just amazing in the ring and such a talent in the ring. Like nobody deserves the success that he's had more than him. He's really worked hard for it. So. It's uh, it's it's just beautiful to see. Wait, yeah. So you knew Ivar before he had the beard, then? Yes. It was That's just crazy. Barefaced, handsome Johnny. <laughs> handsome Johnny. Yes. Look up those tapes. Yeah. And if you have criticism on him, send them to Ivar on his account and tell him that his matches were bad and harass <laughs> that man like he's been harassing me over the past decade plus. I like Thank you. you. I like you using this platform. That's right. To, That's to right. Get, to, Spread to bully the word. Ivar. That's yes. yes. <laughs> it's a thing. It's a thing. So, what did it mean for you uh, to beat Jericho for the IC title so early Man. in your career? So a lot. So, so for me, the IC title was always the workhorse title. Obviously, people ask me who my favorite wrestlers are, and it always goes between like you know Rey Mysterio, Ricky the Dragon, Steamboat, and Shawn Michaels. All have been Intercontinental Champions. The latter two, some of the greatest Intercontinental Champions that you have had in this industry. And then you talk about Jericho. So at the time, uh, I lived in Tampa. I read uh, A Lion's Tale, Jericho's first book. And then I ran into him in a, at a smoothie shop. 
I was like, oh, what's up, Chris? Oh, how you doing? And I'm like, oh my, I don't know this man. You know what I'm saying? I just read his book and I thought that like I was, I, I knew you, I know your life. I, I, I read what you said. I know your whole life. We know each other. Like, you know, I, I don't know you, bro. You don't know me. You know, I'm over here just like we're buddies. But he's been, he, he's always been awesome. Um, for, even from that day, like really just like welcoming and, and you know, just willing to help. And um, so for him to be the one that I beat for the Intercontinental Championship, number one, that was my first title ever. And, and I'd only been in the industry for like maybe three, four years at that time, but I hadn't won any titles on the Indies. I didn't win any titles in, um, you know, at FCW or, uh, you know, in Deep South. So uh, just to be in there with a ring general like Chris, it was an awesome experience. And again, just like, all right, let's listen. Let's listen, you know, whatever you want to do. Oh, we're going off, off track right now? Okay, cool, man. Yeah, I'm here for it, man. So I was always appreciative of just being in the ring with him. And then not to mention, too, like that match uh, Shawn Michaels was involved in, too. Because at the time, like, Jericho and him were feuding. Yep. So that was the time, yeah, like, Shawn, Shawn's wife was involved in that. It got, like, real personal. It was really, really cool angle. So for me to even be in that fold was just incredible. So, um, yeah, an incredible honor to be able to, uh, to, to dethrone Y2J for, for the Intercontinental Championship. It's, you know, it was on a lot of different levels, it was great. Well, since it was so early in your career, I wonder, like, what did you learn most about what it takes to be a champion in WWE during that time? So I feel like sometimes people underestimate the amount of extra work that happens yeah. when you become a champion. I think, again, for me, like, that since the Intercontinental Championship was always the workhorse title, you know, is somebody okay over there? Somebody's, <laughs> someone want to help that man? Someone Somebody's screaming, is no one going to say anything? Is no one going to help that man? He's screaming at the top of his lungs. <laughs> oh, he's over there in Taker's house, at the haunted house. Wow. Okay, cool. One of the two. But... He's, oh, the 2K. I was getting yeah, frustrated. That, that would be me, too, getting frustrated, too. But, yeah, so, so it was really important for me as Intercontinental Champion to be somebody that embodied that workhorse mentality, to be able to go out and defend your title in a six-pack challenge or, you know, um, go up against some of the best technical wrestlers or be able to just, like, be almost a chameleon and have, like, just to be able to go up against anybody that has any, any style and compliment them and vice versa. Like I really pride myself on being able to go in there with anybody and have a great match. So that to me was what was most important was the quality of the matches, the quality of the work, the quality of the, the, the title of being the champion to be the best in that, in that field, in that category. So um, the, the work rate was always what was most important to me to uh, really show people and to show yourself that you belong in that championship role. It's cool to hear you say that the IC title meant so much to you as a kid too, because you were so synonymous with it for a while that it makes sense. It's cool to hear that, you know, full circle type yeah. thing, you know? No, no doubt, no doubt. So I, I want to know, with, we, we got all this Undertaker stuff here. Yeah. And I was wondering, you know, you hear about, you know, Undertaker always talking now about how he lived the character for 30 years. Yeah. Um, are you happy that you didn't have to do that with a Jamaican accent? Oh man, the like, liberation. So it was a it was kind of an emotional roller coaster, and I've told told the story a few times on a different a bunch of different interviews. But um, so initially when I came in, Vince was like, "Hey, look, you got to do everything in character. I want every interview to be in character." So at the time, we had WWE magazine. Do people read magazine like actual paper anymore? Not no. just digital. So magazine, we had the WWE magazine, and they would call me, and I'd just get like a two hundred three number, so I'd you know answer the phone and be like, "Oh, hello." Like, yeah, this is uh, Scott Dorsey, and I'm calling for uh, Kofi. Is Kofi there? I'm calling for the magazine. We have an interview. And I'd be like, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, he's here. Hold on. <coughs> Wagwan, it's Kofi Kingston here. You know, you got an interview going on. What's up? And he would ask me all the questions, you know. So it was like a silly situation because it's like, you know that I'm not Jamaican. And I know that you know that I'm not Jamaican. But Vince said that I have to put this accent on. And now we got to do this, play this game, you know, and I got to interview you with this accent. And matter of fact, so at the sign, you know, uh, SOS by Kali Buds, we did something where he's like legit from Bermuda. He grew up in Bermuda. He has a real accent. And for those of you who are not Jamaican, know that my accent was garbage. It was terrible. All the Jamaicans were mad at me on, on MySpace, talking about how bad the accent was. And I knew it was bad. <laughs> I didn't need to hear it. But they kept on telling me. So I had to do an interview with Kali Buds where it was like superstar to superstar. And I had to put on my fake Jamaican accent with a real man from the Caribbean 
who had a real Caribbean accent, and it was one of the most just, just embarrassing things that I, that I had to do. But Vince told me that I had to have the accent when I did these interviews, so I'm sorry, but I had to do it. So um, one interview I did with uh, BBC, uh, the, I think the guy's name was Leslie Goff. Not that I'm bitter about what he did, <laughs> what he tried to do to me, but he said, uh, you know, he's like grilling me, and he's like, well, yeah, uh, and he was from he was from England too. He's like, oh yeah, uh, Kofi, uh, K your 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 name Kofi is actually a Ghanaian name, right? And you you uh, are, are Ghanaian, right? And I was like, oh no 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 no, I'm not Ghanaian. No, you see, well, my mom she really had a, a, an affection for the motherland, and Kofi is her way of having a tribute to the motherland. So. I'm just BSing him, you know. That's so good. I'm, yeah. I'm bobbing and weaving. He's asking me all these hard-hitting questions, and I'm just shaking him off. You know what I'm saying? No, no, you won't catch me. But after the interview, I was flustered, and I'm sweating. I'm like, oh my god, like this dude is really grilling me about like my my background, man. He know he knows. He's gonna know. And then like 15 minutes later, my mom calls me and says like, oh, Cole, someone just called me about uh the, the, your your career, and he asked me about if you were Jamaican. I said no, but he's from Ghana. But you know he just has to do it for work, and you know he's really trying to like. Oh get his... no! So now mom. I'm like mom, mom, K Fame, mom, <laughs> K Fame, yeah, it's over. So then, like two days later, like Leslie Goff writes this article, and you can go out and, and Google it. And this is BBC. This is like a reputable, yeah. like news Legit entity outlet. Come on, man. You know this is world wrestling entertainment. You know there are people out here that play characters. This show is out of character. Yeah. Some people play characters on there. You know, The Undertaker's not really like a walking zombie. He's not actually dead. He's alive. Shockingly. He has kids. <laughs> you know? You know what I'm saying? We, we know. So like, he, you know, so, so then the article comes out and he's just talking about like, oh, well, Kofi is ashamed of his culture and his heritage and this and then he's you know, he's not, and just like bash me. I was like, oh my God. I said, it's over, bro. I survived these vignettes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He just kicked this sand in your accent, face, you know? You know, and all for this and now it's over. So I go in and it was in New Orleans. I go into the office and Vince, I said, Vince, we got to talk, man. It's over, bro. Like they know, they know. <laughs> the cat's out of a bag. And he's like, well, you know, you, you might think that everybody uh, knows, but it's just a small section of people that knows. You, we, you're still going to go out there and do that accent. I'm like, no. <laughs> okay, so then like six months later, he calls me back into his office and he's like, yeah, I think we're gonna have you drop the accent today. I said, oh, oh, for real? Okay. <laughs> so then you know, like obviously the, uh, the, the, the uh, I think it was like bragging rights where I was out there on the team and we're all arguing, right? And everybody knows Triple H. I said, okay, guys, if, we, if, the, if, the, if, they, if they see us like this, man, they're gonna run right through us, man. Any questions? Yeah, I got a question. Aren't you supposed to be Jamaican? And oh, uh-oh, you got me. <laughs> and from that moment, that was it. You know, it wasn't like a huge like storyline. What's funny too is like, when that happened, nobody cared. It's yeah. not like people were like, oh, it, he's been yeah, lying to yeah, us yeah. this whole time? <laughs> well, this is terrible. And, and you know what I mean? And I thought like, okay, people are gonna be mad. I said, I can never go to Jamaica because people are gonna be mad that I tried to imitate their culture and I'll never go. And I remember I'd never been there before. And it was like maybe three years later that they uh, we had, I had an appearance there. And I'm like, guys, you can't send me here. They're not they're not gonna let me come back. Do you know what I tried to do? I tried to be Jamaican because I listened to Damian Marley. I listened to his album, and I thought I could just go out there and put this accent on. And now they're gonna. So of course I go over there, and everybody's cool. You know, everyone's just like, yeah, well, we knew you were Jamaican, you know, but we like that you represent. It was all love, you know. So every team was Irish. That's what they say. That's what they say. That is what they say there. So I've been there. Um, that is what they say. Yeah, it was liberating to like be able to drop the accent, and you know, the only other person that had the same struggle as me was Santino, because he's actually from Canada, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, he'd have to come out and be ah oh, Santino, <laughs> yeah, and he'd have to put on. So we would just sit in the bleachers sometime and we would just tell our stories like, man, yeah, the magazine called this. We got to put on this accent. He's like, oh. Me too, and we're just, every, this is the only, we could relate to each other. So when I got to finally like drop it, you know, we, you know, we had the conversation and he's like, all right, you know, it's kind of like a little dap, like, hey man, you, you got out, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you got he out. The, he was the only one that could relate How to How is it on the other level. side? So, yeah, <laughs> but it was really liberating because a lot of times it's like hard enough to remember like what you have to say in front of millions of people, let alone like how you're saying it. So the fact that I didn't have to worry about how I, had to butcher an accent and you know 
use an entire culture's, you know, you know, just just words and all that. Um, it was just liberating. It was a big, you know, relief off of my uh, off my back. For sure. I, I'm glad you said that you've been to Jamaica because that was next on my list yeah, of questions. Yeah, I really yeah, wanted yeah. to know if you've ever actually <laughs> been to Jamaica. Yeah, man, it was great. It was awesome. Like I said, everyone was nice. At the time, I was still eating chicken, and there was a real like, uh, uh, gosh, like just jerk chicken. Yep. Uh, made on like this big like straw stove and it was really really good so I got to really immerse myself in the culture and be there for like four or five days like a lot of times we get to travel the world but we don't get to actually see the world and take the culture in because we're in one city and then that night we're gone yep so that was a time where I got to actually take in the culture and be there for a few days and everyone was really really cool you mentioned SOS do you think you'll ever actually use it again for yourself? Because the rest of New Day is using single I, songs right now. Why yeah, can't you bring SOS back? You would be surprised at how many people ask that. Like on a weekly basis, there's so many people. Well, you guys all want to hear and bring SOS back, you right? Hear SOS, right? SOS. I hear that shout that. People are like, I, I, I'm eating Shelton. I'm like, no. <laughs> I hear them shouting, not I'm eating Shelton. No, I'm not consuming that man. No. But uh, yeah, man. I always say, like, if you want to hear SOS, all you got to do is go on to Peacock or go to the network, you know, wherever you are, and you go and watch old Kofi Kings and stuff, and you can hear all the I don't SOS like that you answer. want. Or if we get another time machine, you know. <laughs> another time machine, can yeah. you, you know, I don't know what happened to our last one. It got stolen. But, um, yeah, it's, it, I don't think that we'll be hearing SOS anytime soon, but you never say never, especially in this industry. Well, how proud are you when you see all that? Woods and Big He have accomplished in singles competition the last year. It's it's so amazing. It's so amazing because uh yeah, yeah give it up. Yeah. Give it up for both give, of them. Yep. Do give it up. Yes. Oh, it's awesome because uh so we laugh about it all the time where like people will ask us like how we got into wrestling. And I have this big story about like how I was too small or I was told I wasn't gonna make it, but I kept on fighting and Woods, same thing, like he kept on fighting and E's like, yeah, someone just asked me if I want to be a wrestler. <laughs> and I said, Yeah, I think it might be cool. Then he went to Florida and then you know he here he is. But I will say that for E especially, like, it's not about, like, how you get here. It's about what you do when you get here. And he's somebody that never, ever rests on his laurels. He's somebody that always is trying to get better every single match with every single move and just trying to get better and better. So um, to see him get to where he got to, to get to be the WWE champion, man, it was so well-deserved, you know? Um, no, nobody deserved it more than E because I told a lot of people, and a lot of people felt this way too, where they said, you know, we got to give E a chance to, to be on his own and, you know, prove that he can make it. And we all knew he had all the tools. He could talk. He was an incredible athlete. He's incredibly strong. He's incredibly witty. He can make you laugh. He can make you cry. He can make you scared. A lot of people haven't seen E really snap. And he's real laid back. But sometimes if you catch him on the wrong day and he snaps, He's so fast and it's very scary. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't, I, the thought of, bro, of angry Big E oh, uh, doesn't no. sound cool you know, at all. Bro, it is something to see and you're like, oh man, I forgot. You could rip me in two pieces <laughs> with one hand if you wanted to. But it's amazing just to see like, um, like hard work actually pay off. Because it doesn't always happen that way. There's a lot of people that work really, really hard or that are deserving and they don't necessarily get a shot. But um, the fact that he was able to do that was amazing. Um, and with Woods, every time we'd have interviews and people would ask us like, hey, Kofi, you're going to be WWE champion one day? I'm like, yeah, man, I think if I work hard enough, I'm going to get there. E, you're definitely going to be champion. You got all the tools. And he's like, oh, he doesn't like compliments. So he tries to like shake it off, you know. But um, Woods, they would ask him, yeah, well, what about you, man? You're going to be WWE champion? He's like, nope, I want to be king of the ring. We're like, oh, every single interview that he was ever asked, he never talked about being champion or being holding this title or that title. It was always king of the ring. And you talk about manifesting, that's all he ever wanted. When he was a kid, he always wanted to be the king of the ring. So when he won at Crown Jewel, it was like, bro, like, come on, yes, yes. And I'm so mad that like, I couldn't be there for it. But to watch it on TV, and I actually filmed some stuff and put it on social media, like, those were genuine emotions, man. And it's like, again, what we do is entertainment, but when you realize like the work is real, the sacrifices are very real, what we put into it is real. The effort that we put into it to entertain people is very real. So when we achieve an accolade that we have set for ourselves since we were little kids, or you know, this was this was this was the goal, man. 
And now to see him come out there with that crown, boy, he look good. You know? That <laughs> yeah, boy dude, look good. Yeah, oh, I honestly, I get Bush. goosebumps when you talk about stuff like Bruh. that. Because I love it, dude. When you it's, see someone go from little kid to adult and achieve that dream, it's yeah. like my favorite thing to see. And you think about King of the Ring, too, and it's like, how many people actually get to be King of the Ring? It's a very small handful, man. So when you get to, when you, when you get, you know, the opportunity to, to, to do that, that is like a, a, a blessing that you are worthy of that crown. You know what I mean? Like you are worthy to be in this select few handful, this small handful of people that get to wear this crown. You deserve to be here, you know? Absolutely. So it's just, it's awesome. I love it. I love it. I have a theory that I'm trying to manifest and that's that Woods is going to have to beat Brock for a world title one of these yeah. days to avenge what Let's he's go. done to the rest of you guys. Yes. That's what I want to yes. see happen, right? You guys like huh? that theory, right? Huh? Let's put it out to the universe. Putting it out there. Come on, man. It's my theory. It's my little theory here. Yeah. Uh, was the King's Hand something that you came up with just to add to it, or was it, it brought to you, or what was the deal with yeah, that? Yeah, it was something that, uh, we, you know, we always brainstorm all the time. We're big Game of Thrones fans, so uh, instantly when we heard about, like, Woods becoming the King of the Ring, it's like, man, what can I do to, to help you achieve this goal, and what can I do to enhance this role? Oh, I can be the Hand of the King. Oh, we can get a pin just like it. And we have such a group, such a, uh, an amazing group of people who are creative enough to come up with the design. Jonathan Davenport comes up with whatever we give him, he knocks it out of the park, whether it be like, hey, man, we want to do some Attack on Titan stuff, man. Make me look like the, master, the, the, the founding Titan. Go. And he comes back with it, and it's got dreadlocks, and, you know, he's running around booty butt naked, you know what I mean? <laughs> Crush, crushing the town and everything, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, we just have a lot of people that uh, – a, a tight network of people that make our our visions in our mind come to reality. And um, yeah, it's, you know, it, it's, I just wanted to enhance that role because again, like I know how hard he worked and how much he wanted to be king. And whatever I can do to help you achieve your goal, you are my brother. So whatever I can do to lift you up, I'm gonna lift you all the way up. You know what I mean? Especially so, considering how much they did that for you during like Kofi Mania bro, and stuff. Yes, and I say like, yes, it was me holding the title, but it was all of us. Because like you said, without the New Day, I don't get the opportunity to show personality. As a matter of fact, up to that point, I'd only held a mic in my hands probably about five times. Crazy. Who knew? Kofi Kingston had a voice. Yeah. You know, they, they didn't want to give me a mic. But with New Day, they gave us a mic every single week. Um, so it was, it was all of us. Yeah, you know, like I, I said in the ring, like we did it. Like we did it, me, Woods, and E, but then also like all of y'all. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it was you guys who, who believed in yeah. me, you know? Uh, a, a lot of times we don't get the chance to build a story over time. Everything is so rushed in this day and age. We have so much content and so much television that we need to get put out. And um, like for, for I hate saying Kofi mania because it sounds so just, it doesn't sound cool coming out of my mouth. When you guys say it, bro, it's Get awesome. Get you hyped up. Okay, yeah. I'm like, hey, Kofi mania happened. <laughs> uh, what, am, what am I talking about? Bro? <laughs> but when, when that experience happened, like it was an 11 year legitimate build. It was like me not being able to sniff the, the, the main title role, not having a single match, not having a, you know, even like a, a, a promo saying that I'm gonna get into this, this, this competition, despite all the titles that I had won with the Intercontinental Championship and Tag Team Championship and United States Championships, why not the big one, you know? So for me, it was like, okay, I'm just gonna keep on working. But, you know, it ended up being this 11 year build. And I always say like, we don't like to see anybody get hurt, but it is inevitable that what we, in, in what we do, that somebody is gonna get hurt. And if Ali doesn't get hurt, then I'm not put in that match in the elimination chamber in Houston. And if I'm not in that match, I'm not in that gauntlet match. And if I'm not in that gauntlet match, people don't realize that like me becoming WWE champion is even possible. So then the movement doesn't even start. So um, yeah, man, it's just, uh, it, it's, it's amazing to think about that when, you know, me as a kid, like that's all I ever wanted to be was WWE champion. And the way that it came about, like fate just smiled down upon me um, and, and mainly like the, again, the people, you guys were the ones who made that happen because, you know, I, uh, I, I'd walk through gorilla, especially after that gauntlet match, everyone was so loud. And even afterwards people were so loud and I could walk through gorilla 
and everybody's talking like, oh man, hey, we might we might have something here, man. Dude, let's let's like let's let's do the right thing. And I'm so fortunate that they actually chose to go that direction because there's a lot of um, you know it's a lot of times where you guys have supported somebody and for whatever reason like it's not reciprocated in terms of the push. So you know I'm very fortunate that for whatever reason the office decided to actually go with what the people wanted, you know, and, and I, I attribute that to you guys because you would not be denied. And um, I just appreciate that so much, you know, so thank you guys. Thank you guys for, for that push, you know? Yeah. Well, and thank you for the entertainment yeah, because you really, man. at the end of the day, you were putting in all that work and like, we were really happy to be yeah. part of it with you, so. <laughs> you, oh boy. <laughs> thank you, Hey, thank you, thank you, man, thank you. All right, well, we gotta wrap things up here, yeah. but I like to end each episode of the show with a segment I call the finishing move, where I talk to my guests about their finishing move. So who's your favorite person to hit the trouble in paradise on? <laughs> Ooh, uh, so probably Miz. And I feel bad because a lot of times, like he means well, but boy, he won't stop running his mouth. He runs his mouth so much. And sometimes you just, you just want to shut him up. <laughs> and sometimes you just have to put your foot in his mouth. <laughs> you know, we used to play uh, PSP a lot and we'd play Madden and Miz would talk so much trash and he wasn't even good at the game. But sometimes, <laughs> like the game is, if you guys play Madden, sometimes the game is against you and the game will decide under no circumstances are you going to win this game. <laughs> yeah. So now I got my guy wide open and I'm throwing the pass. Why is it going this way? Why is it being intercepted? Why is it a pick six? So now Miz is on the other side receiving all this benefit from the game just hating on me, you know? <laughs> and now if he wins the game, then I never hear the end of it. You know what I'm saying? He just runs that mouth! So uh, I think it was actually on, was it on ECW? I don't remember. I think we were feuding for the uh, United States Championship. And um, he charged at me at the end of the match. And I gave him like a little pass by and I kept on spinning. And when I came through that trouble in paradise was coming and he hit the ropes like this. And then as soon as he turned around, my <laughs> foot was here. Bah! <laughs> And I was like, oh no. And the reason like I knew immediately that it hurt him was because my foot hurt. <laughs> my shin was killing me and I wear kick pads. <laughs> and I was like, oh man. But now like we go backstage and people are like, oh my God, is he okay? Luckily that was the last thing we had to do and he was not okay. <laughs> but I can't like pull the doctor over to me cause they're looking at Miz. I'm just like, yeah, you know what? Uh, but, but what about my shin? <laughs> You know, but so, so that was probably like, and, and luckily, and I, I say it in jest, but we don't try to go out there and like intentionally yeah. maim people. Of course. He's got, the man's got a family for Christ's sake. He's you the know? most common answer He's, for that question. You know, yeah. At most of the time people oh, say yeah. Miz. So yeah, man. It's, you're not the only one he there. Just that mouth, his mouth running a marathon, boy. <laughs> you know? and, and lastly, what's the most memorable time that you hit the trouble in paradise and why? Well, um, if I were to say uh, anything but WrestleMania 35, hitting it on Daniel Bryan, um, I would be lying. So definitely that, um, and, and for so many reasons, because uh, when you're around this industry for a long time, you tend to get a little bit jaded because things are always changing. So when I knew that I was gonna win that match, I was like, eh, they're gonna change it at the last second. I'm not gonna get my hopes up. So the entire day, like everybody's trying to hype me up, you know, hey man, you got it tonight. I'm just like, yeah, yeah, we'll see, you know? Cause I, in the back of my mind, I just knew like they're gonna, they're gonna try to mess with me. <laughs> We're gonna get out there and be like, you know what? No, Daniel, you know what I mean? He's your, your cattle mutilation. Oh, what? No, he, that's, no, not, no, that's no. not what it's called anymore. You can't, no, oh, they changed. It. So I thought they were gonna switch it on me, you know? But um, it wasn't until like uh, the music actually hit that I actually, I was like, oh my God, it's actually gonna happen. So for so many reasons, and I'll try to make this brief and it's not gonna be brief, and I'm already making it long by telling you that it's not gonna be brief. But, um, you know, so, so for a lot of reasons, it's like, for, for me, it was a childhood dream come true. When I used to be in my front yard, pretending to be a WWE superstar, I envisioned myself being the WWE champion. With me, Woods and E, I've told you our bond and how much we've worked and how hard we worked to get to that point. We envisioned it and we won that championship. A few minutes later, my uh, family was coming in the ring. And now it real like, you know, I'm a big believer in like everything happening for a reason. And 
the reason that I was not in the main event title scene was that so my kids and my wife could see what all the sacrifice was for. For me to miss all the birthdays and the you know anniversaries and the holidays and all of that, to miss all of those things, they got to be in the ring in front of you guys, in front of 85,000 people and feel the energy and the excitement and the elation. So for everybody, and then you know taking it like a step further, that was the first WrestleMania that my dad was at. You know, so he got to see me win the WWE Championship. Um, all the uh, uh, people of color who had never seen an African-born WWE Champion now believe that something is, uh, this is possible because it actually happened. So to provide that sense of motivation for an entire culture of people, for me to be at the center of that was just so just amazing because it was such a powerful moment. But then even beyond race, for people who have struggled in general, everybody knows what it feels like to be at a crossroads where you've been working so hard, you've been trying so hard to attain a goal, and for whatever reason, like, you can't get there. So you come to the crossroads and it's like, do I keep on going or do I quit? And for me, I could have quit at any given time. I was actually very close to quitting before Woods and E approached me about being in the new day. But I kept on going, I kept on working hard, and I became the WWE Champion. And everybody who has been in that situation got to see what happens when you work. No matter what, no matter what struggles you're having, you keep on pushing and you can achieve what it is that you set out to achieve. So for me, that's why Kofi Mania was so big. Give it up for you that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's why it was so big. So to be at the center of all of that and um, you know, to be the, the, the motivating factor to allow people to believe that they can achieve whatever it is they want to achieve. I'm not supposed to be here because I wasn't big enough. My legs are really skinny. I don't have any inner chest muscles. It's all sternum. I'm not so, a prototypical wrestler. That's not me. I'm not the poster boy. But somehow, some way, I've been able to achieve my childhood dream by becoming the WWE champion. So anything is possible, you know? So long-winded answer like I told you it was going to be. No, but, I, but dude, that was so you know, inspiring, so, dude. Like, yeah, I love that, dude. And yeah, I'm so yeah. happy for you that you were able to do that. It's thank really you, awesome. And thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you for having me on, man. And thank you guys for being here in person. Thank y'all. Love y'all, raising the roof. Yeah. Like the 90s, bro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, well, we're done here. We're gonna be yeah. finishing up here. Everyone, make sure you go subscribe to the WWE on Fox YouTube channel while you're here watching this video. That's where you can find clips from Raw and SmackDown. Every week you can find this show, Add a Character, every Monday at 9 a.m. Eastern. Also, go follow WWE on Fox on social media. All right, that's it. I'm done, officially tapping out for now. Until next time, I'm Ryan Satin, and this is Out of Character. Download the all-new Fox Sports app now.